Hi there and welcome to this video on GCSE Biology for the AKA specification focusing on cell structure and in particular cell specialisation. I'm Shumana from StudyMind, where we help you revise GCSE Biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification and to you. If you're new here, make sure you click the subscribe button. Whilst you are watching, please leave any comments below if you're unsure about anything and let us know if it's your first time watching our videos so we can send you our free revision materials. We also have helpful timestamps below for each part of the video to help guide you through the specification. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to tutorial 3 of 6 on cell structure. Today we'll be looking at cell spe specialisation, <laughs> if I can actually say it. So, in the last tutorial, we went through the organelles found in animal, plant and bacterial cells and we compared the functions of each of these organelles, so do feel free to go back and recap on that. And we're just going to build further upon what we learnt in this session. So, today your key learning objectives are to learn the definition of specialisation and examples of specialised cells. And these are your specification points. So, cells develop as the organism does. Cells are adapted to perform specific functions and these cells can work alone or they can work with other specialised cells to make a tissue. Specialised cells working with cells or tissues make an organ and organs can work together to make an organ system. So we're just going to go through this step by step. So you can see the basic functional unit which is the cell. And now we have tissue. So multiple cells make up your tissue. Tissues come together to form a structural unit called an organ. And finally, many organs work together to form an organ system. So let's just take a look at this in a little bit more context. Right, so as I was saying on the previous slide, we have our cells which group together to form a team or a tissue. Multiple tissues form an organ and many different organs work together to form an organ system. So let's look at the respiratory system, for example, and perhaps work backwards from there. So we know the respiratory system is formed mainly of the lungs, here. The lungs, well, what makes up the lungs? The surface exchange area is made up from epithelial tissue. And following on from that, we know that many cells make a tissue, so the epithelial tissue is made up of epithelial cells. In the same way, let's look at the transport system in plants. So, we have our transport system. The organ is the root. The tissue is the root tissue. And the tissue itself is formed of many cells. And the functional um, property of them is that they are root hair cells. So it's pretty self-explanatory. If you just memorise that it goes from cells, which make up tissues, which make up organs, which make up organ systems, you can then work backwards from any system, whether it be an animal or a plant, and use that to work backwards through to what type of cell makes up the functional unit of the system. Right, so now let's have a look at some examples. So, sperm cells. So sperm cells are used in reproduction. Sperm cells transfer genetic information from the male parent to the female parent. And sperm cells therefore have to be adapted to fertilisation. So let's just take a closer look at the um, structure of a sperm cell. So. First of all, let's take a look at this structure here, the acrosome. 
So the acrosome is at the head of the sperm. This is the head of the sperm and this is the tail. I'll just label that for you. Head. So the acrosome contains enzymes that are used for the, di for the digestion of the outer layers of the egg cell to allow the sperm to fuse with the egg cell. Now if we move from the head of the sperm to the end of the sperm, the tail end of the sperm, we can see this structure here, which is just as I said, the tail. And this is just used for motility. So the sperm has to swim through the female reproductive system towards the egg. So this is basically its method of doing that. We also have mitochondria. Now remember, mitochondria are the genetic powerhouse. Oh, sorry, why am I saying genetic? They're just the energy powerhouse. So mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. And the sperm cell obviously requires a lot of energy to move. And that's why mitochondria are so, so important. So actually you find lots of mitochondria in sperm cells because mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell and they provide energy for motility of the sperm. And finally, we have this very big nucleus here, so this whole green structure. And it's important that the sperm cell has such a big nucleus because it's holding the genetic information. So just to recap, we have our acrosome, which contains enzymes that are used for the digestion of the outer layers of the egg cell. We have the tail for motility. We have mitochondria to provide energy for motility. And we have the nucleus that contains the genetic material of the cell. And that's just a summary of all of that for you. Right, let's move on to nerve cells. So nerve cells are required for the transmission of electrical impulses. Nerve cells send impulses around the body of animals in order to aid sensation and movement. So that means that nerve cells are adapted to carrying impulses. So let's take a look at how they may be, may be adapted to carrying impulses. Perhaps you could pause the, the um, presentation at this point and maybe try and make a few educated guesses as to how sperm, um, sorry, nerve cells may be adapted to carrying impulses. But I'll go through it with you anyway. So, they have a long axon, that's this bit here. So this moves the impulse from one part of the body to the other. So from A to B. They also have many dendrites, these long tail end structures here, that contact other nerves. And this happens at special junctions called synapses using, using neurotransmitters. We also have mitochondria. So making these neurotransmitters, which I can, for example, show you being released here. So to make the neurotransmitters, we're going to need lots of energy, and that's provided by the large number of mitochondria. And the mitochondria are located in the vicinity of where the production of the neurotransmitted is required in the cell. And then we also need insulation in the cell so that the um, electrical impulse is transferred as efficiently as possible and as quickly as possible. So nerves have a myelin coat, which you can see here. That's your myelin sheath or coat, and that insulates the nerve cells. So that's just a summary of what I've just said. Now let's take a look at muscle cells. So muscle cells are used for movement. They contract and they relax, allowing different types of movement. So actually, there are three types of muscle fibres, but we're just going to take a look at striated and smooth muscle. So striated muscle is the muscle you usually think of. It's the muscle found in your biceps, for example, allowing you to move. Smooth muscle, in contrast, is found in some vessels and in your digestive system. And so smooth muscle is controlled by um, subconscious processes, so you can't consciously cause your smooth muscle to contract. 
And so, for example, this moves food through your gastrointestinal tract. So you don't tell your tummy to contract, do you? It's kind of all done automatically. So that's your smooth muscle, not your skeletal muscle or your striated muscle. So muscle cells must be adapted for contraction. Thus, they must have many mitochondria in order to provide energy. Striated muscle has many mitochondria, and remember, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, and this provides energy. It also has lots of protein to aid movement by sliding over one, by sliding of one muscle fiber over the other muscle fiber. And muscle muscle also contains a lot of glycogen, which is a substrate for respiration. So now let's take a look at some examples in plants. So root hair cells are required for absorption of water and mineral ions in plant cells. They're found on the surface of roots and are involved in absorption of water and mineral ions from the soil, which the plant needs for photosynthesis and survival. So therefore, root hair cells must be adapted for absorption because that's their key function. So perhaps pause the video at this point and try to think of ways in which this cell looks like it's adap adapted for absorption. Well, I'll talk through it anyway. So, look at this surface area. That's a really extensive surface area. Much more extensive than if the cell was shaped like this, for example. So, Root hair cells greatly increase the surface area of the roots in order to increase the movement of water into the cell. In addition, they have this permanent vacuole that you can see in the middle. So the speed of osmosis, which remember is the movement of water into the cell or out of the cell, but in this case we would want water moving into the cell for the plant, um, down its osmotic gradient or its osmotic potential, so from a high water content to a low water content. So this permanent vacuole increases the speed of osmosis. In addition, we have mitochondria here. So the root hair cells have many mitochondria and that's to increase the energy available for the active transport of mineral ions. And remember, active transport requires ATP and that's where that's energy and that's where we need our mitochondria coming in because they are the powerhouse of the cell and they provide this energy. So that was quite a complicated slide so just perhaps pause it at this point and recap and we're going to move on to have a look at the xylem and the phloem in plants. So, the xylem is involved in support and transport in plants. It aids the movement of mineral ions and water from the roots to the leaves and stem of the plant. So let's try to think of some ways in which the xylem is adapted to support and transport. First of all, let's take a look at this spiral shape. Here. So the spiral-shaped buildup of lignin in the, in the xylem cell walls kills the tissue. This then leaves hollow tubes. So this tube is hollow. And that's for the water and mineral ions to move through from the roots upwards. So that's your water and your ions. In addition, lignin, this structure, strengthens the xylem, aiding its job as support. So now let's contrast this to phloem. So phloem is involved in transport in plants. Whilst the xylem transports water and mineral ions, the phloem transports the products of photosynthesis through the plant. So that means that, again, the phloem has to be ad adapted for transport. 
So how does it do this? Well, the flow and cell walls form a sieve plate as they disintegrate. These sieve plates allow for the movement of food. And thus you can see that larger molecules can travel through the structure that is the phloem. In addition, the phloem has these companion cells here. And the companion cells basically help keep the phloem alive as they have mitochondria, again, the powerhouse of the cell. They have mitochondria for energy transfer. And this energy is used to move the food through the phloem. So, this is a summary of everything we've covered today. There was a lot of detail in the parts, oopsie, there was a lot of detail in the parts especially detailing the structure and related function of specialised cells. So please do go back and re-watch this if you do need to. So well done for today and I'll see you in our next tutorial. Thanks for watching this free video from Study Mind. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to catch our newest videos by clicking below and leave a comment on a topic you'd like a video on. Click here to watch more videos in our series for GCSE Biology or visit our website studymind.co.uk for free past paper compilations by topic and specification.